everyone and welcome. My name is Kate. Some of you may now be very familiar with me and thank you for joining us again. And if not, I am the distance learning specialist here at the National World War II Museum in lovely New Orleans, Louisiana. And today we are going to be talking about Dr. Seuss and his role in World War II. And we are gonna start actually with a little bit about who Dr. Seuss is or was. So Theodore Seuss Giesel was born in Springfield, Massachusetts on March of 1904. He was actually the second child of successful German American family. His family ran a successful brewery until prohibition closed it down and then his dad worked for the city's public park system. By all accounts, Dr. Seuss had a relatively happy childhood. He attended a local Lutheran church and he sold war bonds for the Boy Scouts during World War I. He also, during World War I, and this is important to think about when we talk about his role in World War II, was the brunt of instances of anti-German bullying during World War I, which impacted his work greatly. So, after he graduated from the local high school, he went on to attend Dartmouth and graduated in 1925. He spent a great deal of his time at college writing for the college's humor magazine. While the editor of the magazine, and so this might kind of prove to some of you out there that just because you make a mistake does not mean that you can't come back from it and be very successful because while he was the editor of the magazine, he was caught in his room drinking bootleg gin. It was prohibition after all and was actually banned from further involvement in this magazine or this college newspaper he loved writing for so much. So, in order to continue writing for the magazine, he needed an alias. Anybody wanna guess what Theodore Giesel used as his alias to continue to write for this college newspaper after being banned? And if you know, or you think you know, you can put it in the Q&A. Bailey's already done it. Or you can talk about it with your class. Yes. Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss, Seuss is actually his middle name, as we learned earlier. And he added the doctor part later in his career. And that's how the famous name of Dr. Seuss was born. After graduating, thinking he might want to become a literature professor, he left to study at Oxford. And while there, he spent more time traveling and doodling than studying and decided that academic life was not for him. While there, he met his first wife, Helen, and decided to make a living as an artist, or at least try to. He moved back to the States and moved to New York and started writing and illustrating for a few different newspapers and magazines, including Judge and the Saturday Evening Post. And one cartoon he created caught the eye of Standard Oil, who hired him to write and draw advertisements from them. This led to a long career of advertising for several companies, and this salary gave him the opportunity to travel and write. And so in the late 30s, and you can see now we are approaching World War II, he started writing children's books. His first book, and to think I saw it on Mulberry Street, many of us have read this book, but you might not know, it was actually rejected 27 times before he got it published. So again, another lesson. First you don't succeed, try, try again. But in 1936, at the age of 32, he vacationed in Germany. He was a third generation American German. And when he was in Germany, and this is during the rise of Nazism in Nazi Germany, he was shocked and appalled to find the country um, moving towards a fascist state. And so he found he could no longer write books for children. He needed to make America aware of the dangers from abroad. 
specifically fascism and the Axis powers. And at home, the dangers of isolationism and prejudice. And so in 1941, all the way until 1943, and now you see we've approached the years of World War II and arrived at them, he created more than 400 political cartoons from the PM newspaper in New York, tackling subjects such as racial discrimination, the dangers of isolationism, social injustice, anti-Semitism, or the hatred of Jews, and um, political issues and political leadership. And in 1943, he joined the army and worked for the Information and Education Division where he created the character Private Snafu. And we can see Private Snafu right here, but before that, I wanna talk about that most of his political cartoons that he drew for the war are available on the US San Diego's um, online library. So we're gonna look at a few here in a second, but if you'd like to look at all of the cartoons he drew during World War II, because this is the only time he draws political cartoons, you can find them on the US UC San Diego's website. But going back to Private Snafu, so Private Snafu was created to help troops during World War II learn their role in the American effort. And he taught by negative example. And there are still many videos um, online, on YouTube, that you can find bits and pieces from his drawings and videos. He worked with people like Frank Capra, Mel Blanc, and Chuck Jones throughout World War II not only to create private snafu for troops, he also wrote Your Job in Germany, a propaganda film about peace in Germany, and Design for Death, a movie study of Japanese culture. Copies of these films are rare or almost non-existent, um, so unfortunately we don't have one, but they were very popular and well-known at the time. So, that takes us all the way to Dr. Seuss's life during World War II. Now, we're gonna talk more about during World War II, but after the war, Giselle returned to writing children's books and produced some of his most famous and beloved titles, those of us that know The Cat in the Hat or The Grinch Stole Christmas and many others. His books are read around the world, translated into many different languages and touched on important lessons and social issues. But why did he do that with his children's books? Well, we actually have to go back to his political cartoons. So before we analyze together one of his most infamous political cartoons, we gotta talk a little bit about what political cartoons are. They actually started with a very famous one created by Ben Franklin's uh, join or die that you can see there to emphasize the importance of colonial unity so way before Dr. Seuss's time and all the way to today where political cartoons can be found in newspapers, magazines, any online um, resource, pretty much everywhere you look um, and Dr. Seuss plays a big role of making them during World War II. But what exactly is a political cartoon, sometimes also known as an editorial cartoon. We can see here that it says they're defined as illustrations or comic strips containing a political or social message that usually relates to current events or personalities. So in today's world, we would find political cartoons about what's going on in 2020. But in 1941 to 45, we see political cartoons about the war, or almost all of them were about the war. And so we are going to focus on a few different things that make up a political cartoon. You can see the list here, we're not gonna go into it, but we're gonna talk specifically about stereotypes or the generalization, usually exaggerated or oversimplified, often even offensive that is used to describe or distinguish a group, and captioning and labels. 
words at the bottom of a cartoon or at the top. If you look at a political cartoon and there are words, they're probably pretty important and you want to analyze them. So this political cartoon we're about to look at, think about stereotypes, captioning, and labels, but also all of the other ones on here because we're now going to analyze this cartoon known as waiting for the signal from home. All right, and this is where I need you guys to help me out. So we talked about the fact that Dr. Seuss drew over 400 political cartoons. This political cartoon was made in February, specifically February 13th of 1942. So my first question to those of you out there, and you can either type it in the Q&A or you can have a discussion with your class or if you're at home for with whoever you're with, where does this political cartoon take place and how do we know that? Let's see what we think. Where does this political cartoon take place? And remember back to the list of things we should focus on. If there are words, they're usually pretty important. All right. So we have a couple guesses coming in. Jordan says California. All right, Jordan. Karina also says California and is guessing the West Coast. And we can see here, looking at the words California, Oregon, and Washington, that they're correct. We know that this is taking place on the West Coast of the United States. Now let's look at the group of people standing in line on this West Coast. And we can see that it's all the way from Washington and they get bigger and then we can actually see what they look like. What group of people or nationality is being portrayed here and how do you know that? All right, we have a couple guesses coming in. Ashley is really on it today. So I don't know if you're individual or if it's a whole group, but thank you for participating today. She is saying that there are some stereotypical Asian features in the people of this cartoon. So she is guessing, guessing that they are Asian. Let's see some other guesses. Anne is also guessing that there are some stereotype types here, and we'll talk about that in a second. So she is guessing someone from Asia, whether it might be Japan or another country. All right, great job. So we talked earlier about how Dr. Seuss's political cartoons often talked about civil rights and against racism and against anti-Semitism. Dr. Seuss had one major blind spot. And that was Americans of Japanese descent or Japanese Americans living in the United States. And we can see here that yes, there are some stereotypical features or caricatures making fun of a group in this cartoon, specifically around their faces and their glasses and how their faces are drawn. So we know that he is making fun of a group most likely from Asia. Now, there's nothing on here that says specifically Japan, but we know that this was drawn in the context of World War II. So what are they being handed? And I'll point to it here. And again, remember thinking the words are important. What are they being handed? And what would you do with that? All right, you guys are on it. We have a bunch of people coming in, including Karina and Ashley, saying TNT. You are correct. We can see the words TNT on here. And there's a bunch in this shed. And what do we do or what can you do with TNT? Let's see what we... All right. Miss Serena Mason's class is saying that it's dynamite and... You can blow things up with dynamite. 
Ashley is also saying that. Jordan is also guessing it. You're correct. So they are being handed something that you can either make into a bomb or blow up with, right? You can blow things up with TNT. So let's recap so far. You guys have decided we've got a group of what we are guessing, people of Asian nationality, standing in line on the West Coast, being handed TNT. Now let's look at this sign above. Anybody want to take a guess? Now this is difficult. What the honorable fifth column means? This one's a tough one. Well, let's break it down. Somebody give me a synonym for the word honorable. If it's something honorable or you're doing something honorable, what does that mean? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it right? Is it wrong? All right. Bailey and Karina both said it's good. It's great. Exactly. When you're doing something honorable, you're probably doing something that you think is right. So we know that whatever this fifth column is, Dr. Seuss is insinuating that these people think it's correct. Ah, Miss Serena Mason's class is saying spies. Yes, the fifth column is a group of people from within a country or a place that try to sabotage it or spy from within, create ruckus from within. And so you're exactly right. He is calling this group a group of spies and they think it's honorable to do it. Now let's look at this man on top and the two ships. Now we know we're on the west coast so we're guessing this is the Pacific Ocean. And the title, Waiting from the Signal from Home. Well, if you know anything about geography, and I know we have a bunch of very smart students out there, this man is looking out across the Pacific, waiting for the signal from home. What country is across the Pacific that on December 7th of 1941, only two months before this um, political cartoon is made, attacked Pearl Harbor? What country attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 1941. All right, Lucy is saying Japan, Karina is saying waiting for Japan, Bailey and Ashley, correct. Nowhere on this cartoon does the word Japan appear, but what we know about history, right, and using our analyzation of this cartoon, we can guess that he's talking about Japan because Japan has just bombed Pearl Harbor and it is across the Pacific Ocean from California. And so is this a positive or a negative portrayal of Japanese Americans or um, Japanese citizens living in America? Is it a positive or negative portrayal of Japanese Americans or Japanese citizens in the United States? All right, I think we have a unanimous answer between Ashley, Jordan, Bailey, and Karina that yes, it is an overall negative portrayal. It is showing them Dan says negative as well in a bad light that they are probably spies on the West Coast getting ready to at any moment sabotage potentially by blowing something up in the United States. And so at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were nearly 120,000 Japanese Americans living on the West Coast. Two thirds of these people were US citizens by birth. So very similar to Theodore Giesel, they had Japanese ancestry, maybe parents or grandparents, but they weren't citizens of Japan. They were American citizens. Theodore Giesel, Dr. Seuss, was a German American. He was an American but he was only a third generation. So his family had been in Germany not that long ago. Many of the, oh, yes, so two thirds were US citizens by birth. Many of the others were prevented by law from becoming citizens, but they would have wanted to. There were laws pre-World War II that stopped allowing Japanese citizens to become citizens of the United States. And soon after Pearl Harbor, 
the American government is going to do something, and it's actually only a few days after this cartoon is created, on February 19th of 1942, that changes the lives of many Japanese American citizens and Japanese citizens living in the United States. Does anybody know what that was, whether you know what it's called in history or the actual um, document? We've got a couple people. All right. So Jordan is saying internment camps. Ashley is saying that this cartoon helps feed the American public on anti-Japanese sentiment so that they could create internment camps and the American public be okay with it. So those internment camps come from Executive Order 9066. That is an order signed by President Roosevelt that basically says anyone living on the coast of the Pacific who the U.S. government deemed to be a potential threat to homeland security could be removed. And on February 13th, 42, just days before the West Roosevelt administration decision to incarcerate all Japanese Americans living on the West Coast, he drew this political cartoon, waiting for the signal from home. In the end, thousands of Japanese American citizens and non-citizens will be re forcibly removed from their homes on the West Coast and relocated to what we now call incarceration camps. And it is political cartoons like this and from many others that helped feed this anti-Japanese sentiment or helped the American public become scared of Japanese people living in the United States. And it is a curious cartoon because by the end of the war, no Japanese American on the West Coast was actually ever convicted of sabotage. General John DeWitt, the individual most responsible for incarceration, could not have asked for more effective propaganda than this waiting from the signal from home. And during the war, Dr. Seuss is unapologetic about this cartoon. He does not say sorry for it because a couple people approached him about it because he was not drawing cartoons like this about Germans, about Italians living in the United States. His one blind spot was Japanese Americans. And so the main message of this cartoon, that Japanese Americans on the West Coast could not be trusted, that they probably or could be working from for Japan, and that something had to be done. And that something was Executive Order 9066, which led to Japanese incarceration. Now, Dr. Seuss, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but stops drawing cartoons in right 1942-43 and joins the war effort. And when he joins the war effort, he draws lots of illustrations, makes documentaries, comes home to, and let me zoom out so you guys can see everything, because this might look a little familiar to you, comes home after World War II and gets out of the US military and goes back to writing children's books. By the end of his life, he will have written over 60 books. And so we're gonna move on to our next part. Now that we've analyzed the political cartoon waiting from the signal from home. We're going to look at three books that he wrote after World War II that actually have to do with World War II, and you may not have known this. I'm sure you either read these books as a kid or maybe read them to someone, but you were actually learning about World War II without even knowing it. So I'm going to need your help here to remember what exactly these books are about before we analyze them. And we're starting with Horton Hears a Who. So I'm gonna pause for about a minute or so, whether you're doing this at home, in your class, or on the Q&A, 
but I want you guys, anybody, to give us a little overview of what happens in Horton Hears a Who. What is this book about? Let's see if anybody remembers. And for those of you at home or in class with someone to talk to, I'm just going to pause here for a second. All right, we have a couple people putting in the Q&A quotes they remember from the book. A person is a person no matter how small from Angelique. Great. Somebody's read it. Let's get a few more. All right, Ashley. Horton finds a little speck with a hole in with a whole world in it. No one in Horton's world, remember he's an elephant, can hear the people in the speck, but Horton does. And Horton fights back for the people on the speck. That was a great overview. Now let's open this to the first page where it talks a little bit about who he dedicated this to. It says, for my great friend, Matsugi Nakamura of Kyoto, Japan. Well, at the end of World War II, Dr. Seuss is stationed in Japan. He actually travels around the country, which is at this point occupied by the United States, and starts to make friends with people in Japan. And he starts to change his mind about his anti-Japanese thoughts and sentiments, especially when he meets what he now calls his great friend, Mitsugi Nakamura. So when he gets back to the States, one of his first books, written in 1954, is dedicated to a man who helped change his mind about a group of people. And this plays into what this book is about. So we know it's dedicated to someone he met right at the end of World War II that helped change his mind. But let's talk about it. What is Horton? Who is Horton? Are there any symbolism or hidden meanings? And there are, especially in this one. So let's go to the last page. And I won't read the whole book to you, although I would love to. From sun in the summer, from rain when it's fallish, I'm going to protect them no matter how smallish. Horton, this large elephant, is protecting a group of people known as Whoville, might be familiar to you, that nobody else can hear and nobody else cares about and they want to destroy. But Horton being the biggest feels the need to protect the little guy. He advocated for sticking up for the little guys who can't defend themselves. And this book is a message of understanding people who are different than you, tolerance. And it is an apology for this cartoon, The Waiting for Signal from Home, where Dr. Seuss, the American public, and the US government did not protect its citizens, or its Japanese American citizens, the little guys in this case, from being incarcerated, from being first forcibly removed from their homes and losing all their possessions. Dr. Seuss is apologizing for all of his anti-Japanese cartoons and quotes throughout World War II in this book by creating a lesson that we all should learn about protecting the little guy if you're the big guy, that everybody's voice matters no matter how small. And he shows it to us because he dedicates it to his friend Mitsugi Nakamura. But there are also many World War II references in this book that you may not have even known. So let's see if we can find a few. And I had actually all these marked, but then somebody took them out, so that's my fault. But let's look here, right? The black eagle dropping Whoville into a field of clovers, it often evokes um, a plane releasing a bomb. Many of the birds, if you look, they kind of are drawn to look like airplanes. 
In the book, the mayor says, and I quote, the black bottom birdie let go and we dropped, we landed so hard that all our clocks stopped. This is referencing, right, when civilians and people were bombed in World War II, often their houses were destroyed, their clocks would stop from all of the destruction and damage. The book continues, um, and they put Horton in a cage, and they threatened to dump Whoville into Beasel Nut Juice, and Horton and the mayor urged the town to take action, and here's where I'm going to need your guys' help again, to similar World War propaganda from another World War II person. Let me read you the quote, and then I want you to guess as to who you think that his Horton speech is referenced referencing. This, cried the mayor, is your town's darkest hour. The time for all whose who's have blood is red to come to the aid of their country. We've got to make noises in greater amounts. What speech or who gave famous speeches in World War II that really sounded like a part of that speech that I just read to you? Anybody want to take a guess? All right. Bailey is guessing Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So is Jordan. Yes, that is one famous speech uh, and speaker. There's another one on the other side of the pond or the Atlantic. Ah, Beth is guessing Churchill. Yes, many of the mayor's speeches in this book are based off of things that Churchill or FDR said. It's got World War II rhetoric. So you didn't even know, but when you were reading Horton Hears a Who or maybe watching the movie, there was World War II symbolism behind it. But that's not the only book. So let's move to the second one. All right. Now I'm going to need your help to remember what happens in this book. This is not as well known. It's um, as Horton Hears a Who, but can anybody tell me what happens in Yertle the Turtle? What happens, and it's okay if you're just talking about it within your class, but anybody in the Q&A, what happens in Yertle the Turtle? All right, so we had someone say that they've actually never read this book before. That's totally fine. It's created in 1950, so very soon after he gets back from World War II. And again, it's not as famous, but Ashley is guessing that the turtles try to rise to the top on the backs of other people, and when the bottom turtle sneezes, it all falls apart. All right. So let's look at this book, Yertle the Turtle. So we'll start with Yertle is the king turtle, right? He wants to be in charge of all the other turtles. And so he does this by trying to take over as much of the land that he can find and that he can see. But how can he see more and more land? Well, he stacks all his turtle subjects on top of each other. No regard to how the turtles feel or if they want to be part of it, he oppresses and manipulates them to create a turtle tower. See what I did there? Now, Yertle's on top of the turtle tower, and there's this one guy at the bottom. His name is Mac. Mac is the turtle at the bottom. Mac doesn't think he's very significant and can make a difference in the world, but he makes one small burp, and the burp shook the throne of the king. And what happens to our turtle tower? Well, guys, it comes crashing down, or should I say tumble? The turtle tower tumbles down. And today, the great yurtle the marvelous he, well, he's king of the mud because that's all that he can see. And the turtles, of course, well, all the turtles are free. As turtles and maybe 
all creatures should be. All right. Well, while I was reading that, Bailey said, wait a minute. Is this like the fall of the Nazis? Bailey, you're exactly correct. So let's go back to the King Yertel at the top. So in his political cartoons in 1942, he starts to draw political cartoons that have turtles in them. Many of his political cartoons will have turtles in them in World War II. After it, he decides to use these turtles to create a children's book about World War II and the lessons we need to learn. And Bailey, you just got part of the lesson. So Yertle is actually supposed to be who? Who do we think Yertle the turtle is supposed to be? The turtle who oppresses and takes over. Yes, it's Hitler. In his first rendition or edition of this book, before it was published, he actually had a mustache on Yertel, but he realized it might be a little bit too obvious. So in the first edit had the mustache, the second edit, which gets published, takes out the mustache. But Yertel the turtle is representing, or there's a little symbolism in there of Hitler. And just like Hitler tries to take over all of Europe and is not nice to many of the people in Europe, Yertle the turtle is not nice to his turtle subjects and oppresses them as well. And by the acts of a few small people or small turtles, everything comes tumbling down. And Yertle the power hungry turtle who oppressed his population to gain control of the land ends up with nothing. And of course we go back to, and all the turtles are free just as all creatures should be. And so he's talking about the fall of Nazism in Europe and what happens when a fascist, oppressive, authoritarian, I really have trouble with that word, guys, comes and tries to take over. I should practice that word, but I thank you for allowing me. And that's Yertle the Turtle. And you might not have even known when you were reading it, but it's about World War II. All right, one last book. This one also not as well known as Horton Hears a Who, but I need some help. The Sneetches. What is The Sneetches about? Anybody read this book? Anybody tell us what The Sneetches are about? Now let's pause here for a moment. You can also say, I've never read it, and that's totally fine. All right. So Ashley is saying, or Stacy is saying, the star belly sneeches are separated by some that have stars and some don't. The ones with the stars on their bellies are considered better than the ones that don't. Bailey is saying that there are difference in the star belly sneeches and the regular bellied sneeches. Jordan is saying there are two groups. Ashley is also saying that something of this book has something to do with the way that people looked. And yes, so Dr. Seuss never draws people. He draws creatures. But The Sneeches is a book about two different groups of Sneeches, right? They live in the same world and one have stars on their stomachs and one group does not, the plain-bellied Sneetches. This book, written in 1961, talks about the fact that star-bellied Sneetches were rude and they mistreated the plain-bellied Sneetches all because they didn't have stars on their stomach. Now, Sylvester McMonkey McBean comes to town and changes everything up. He's got a machine that can take the stars off and on the star-bellied sneeches. And so in a just a few 
minutes, everybody's got stars and everybody's equal. Well, the original star belly sneakers aren't too fond with that. They take him up on his offer to take their star bellies off. And before we know it, those two groups are fighting and disliking each other worse than ever. And Mr. McBean leaves town with a boatload of money that he's made off of two groups not liking each other based on what they look like. Now let's go to the last page. Mr. McBean was quite wrong, I'm quite happy to say, that the Sneetches got quite smart that day. They, that day they decided that Sneetches are Sneetches and no kind of Sneetch is the best on the beaches. That day, all the Sneetches forgot about stars, whether they had one on that upon thars. So, before we talk about the message, we kept using the term star-bellied sneeches or stars on them. Does anybody know which World War II reference Dr. Seuss is discussing in this book when discussing stars on a group? All right, Ashley and Jordan are both guessing the yellow stars of David that Jews of Europe under Nazi control had to wear during the Holocaust, yes, Vita, to differentiate them from everybody else, to separate, to humiliate. They're all people, but one group has stars on their clothes, and they're not green stars like in the Sneetches, they're yellow stars. And so what then do we think the message or what inspired this book about two different groups learning that they're all the same. Yeah, Ashley, uh, Ashley, you could teach this class. Equality, humanity, right? That on the surface, they looked different based justly on their stars, but underneath, they're all the same. The story was inspired by his opposition to anti-Semitism and racism. Again, remember that he had a blind spot. There were blind spots. Um, so we can't say everything he did was not um, anti-racist. But this book was created in 1961 um, to help us remember the lessons from World War II especially the Holocaust, that just because someone is different from you, whether they look different, it's their religion, they speak a different language, it doesn't matter because underneath, a sneech is a sneech and a person is a person. And there you have it. Those three books, right? The Sneeches, Yertle the Turtle, and Horton Hears a Who, written after World War II, had messages that Dr. Seuss, even sometimes himself, had to learn, right? He didn't have it all right away, but he decided that the best thing he could do for the rest of his life was to show that just because we have differences doesn't mean we are different. And he did that by writing children's books. And again, there are 60 books he writes in the end, and these three um, are some of the ones that have World War II, you know, hit either hidden meanings or symbolism. And there are many cartoons as well that we could, we could talk about. But I want to get to some questions that you guys have or comments as well. Because I saw that Beth had not a question, but she said it's interesting that he was bullied for being German during World War I and then goes and does basically the same thing to Japanese Americans in World War II. And you're right. And when you're studying Dr. Seuss, it's a struggle. And I don't have a great explanation for it. He doesn't ever really discuss it, but it's true. During World War I, he's bullied for being German because the Americans are fighting Germany by the end of World War I. And then he goes around and he does the same thing. Now there's one 
difference. Growing up in Massachusetts, Dr. Seuss was surrounded by many German American and Italian American immigrants, or first or second or third generations. And because he knew these people, and he either spoke their language, because he spoke German, or he interacted with them, they are different. But he understands them because he knows them, or he took the time to get to know them. Most Japanese Americans, whether citizens or non-citizens, called Issei and Nisei, were living on the West Coast. Theodore Giesel, Dr. Seuss, didn't have much or any interaction with German Americans. And because this group is different and unknown, they become bad. And so that's not an excuse at all for his waiting for the signal from home political cartoon, but it does help explain a little bit about how that was able to happen. But thank you, Beth, for your very, very insightful and interesting comment. And Dan said, wait, did he work for the Germans or does he work for the Americans? Dan, he works for the Americans. He is a German-American, meaning his great-great-grandparents came over from Germany. But he is an American. He's in the U.S. Army during World War II, and he, he writes and works for many U.S. companies. He was not from Germany. He grew up in Massachusetts and went to college in the United States. But he is of German heritage. Hope that helps. So any other questions that you guys have, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I can answer hopefully anything you have about Dr. Seuss and World War II. If you are interested and you are a teacher out there, I'm sure it's available on some online buying, but there is a book, Dr. Seuss Goes to War, right here, that actually has an introduction by Art Spiegelman, which not only has all of his cartoons in them, all 400 of them, including the waiting from Signal from Home, but it has a really, really good detail of his time in World War II um, and analyzes or helps you analyze all of his cartoons. And so this book I would highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about Dr. Seuss in World War II. Oh, we had a great question that I actually cannot answer, but I am very curious to see if this is correct or if we can figure it out. But Elizabeth is asking, did he get his inspiration for green eggs and ham because the color of eggs and ham and sea rations? I cannot confirm that, but I would guess that there's probably, even if he didn't know it, some inspiration there. Um, but we can do some research with our historians and see if we have any actual physical proof that that was the case. Um, but you know, I've never been asked that question. Great question. And I would, if I had to take an educated guess, I would probably say yes. Um, but we will look into that. So thank you, Elizabeth. Any other questions? If you're interested, um, ah, Ashley, great question. Did his cartoons get as much critical reception as then as they do now? No. So Dr. Seuss was not as was not really famous actually um, during his time at the PM newspaper when writing these political cartoons. He's unknown at this point. And so he is just one of many, many illustrators drawing political cartoons during World War II. It's not until after, and he became famous with his books, right, Dr. Seuss and the Cat in the Hat and the Grinch Who Stole Christmas and the ones we looked at, that people then start to go back and look at the political cartoons that he drew during World War II. So it's not until he's a famous children's author um, that people start to really criticize and analyze and look at those cartoons made from World War II. Great question. All right, we have another question. Um, Miss Serena wants to know, what do I consider to be his most or two most impactful, ooh, World War II political cartoons? Okay, well, 
We've already kind of looked at one a little bit, but I would, and we'll go back to the doc cam here and see if I can zoom in. Um, I would definitely argue that because a famous children's book comes out of this political cartoon, and I'm trying to focus, so I apologize for a second, um, that this, you can't build a substantial V out of turtles is one. And let's, since we're here, let's analyze it. Let's figure this out. All right. Why would he use turtles when talking about production? Why would turtles not be good for production? Yeah, yes, slow, right? We all know this, slow producers. So you can't build a substantial V. What's the V for? What does the V represent? Victory, yes. So you can't be victorious with slow dawdling producers. What is he saying in this political cartoon? Is he really talking about tur turtles? Do we think, and I'll use my pointer, do you think he's talking about turtles? Who are the producers? What, who is he talking to in this? Yes, the, uh, the American producers, right? Whether it's making cars or airplanes. Dr. Seuss, when he came back from Germany in World, uh, well, pre-World War II in 1936, he was really trying to encourage the American population to get involved in the war. He actually wasn't for America getting involved in the war, but he saw kind of the writing on the wall that America was going to have no choice to get involved in what was going on in Europe because eventually it would affect us and that we need to get ahead of it. So uh, from his 400 political cartoons, many of them are anti-Hitler, but a, a large segment of them are anti-isolationism. And let's talk about what isolationism is. Isolationism, because it was big pre-World War II in the United States. All right, yeah, isolationism, um, staying out of foreign affairs. And so Dr. Seuss makes many political cartoons about encouraging Americans and American companies to get involved with the Allies and help stop Hitler. And so I would say this is probably one of them. Um, now, the second one... Let's see here. Okay, here's, a, here's another one. And these are also the ones that I've got printed out. Um, this one, made in 1941, so some of his earliest cartoons. Ho-hum, when he's finished pecking down that last tree, he'll quite likely be tired. So first, let's talk about who he is, this bird right here. Remember, he's never going to draw people. Who do we think, and again, going back to how do we analyze political cartoons, symbolism, big one here. Who is this bird representing? Right, Hitler. We can see the swastika on it. And it even, his head even looks like Hitler. And the Hitler bird has taken down Poland, France, Holland, Norway, Greece, all these countries in Europe, and he's pecking and eating away at England. And we go to this ostrich looking bird here with a hat on top of him who's saying, hmm, by the time he gets done with England, he'll never be concerned with my tree. Who is this bird representing? Or who do you think this bird is? Uncle Sam. Yes, Ashley says, this is the Uncle Sam and this is about America not wanting to get involved. Exactly. This is really, this cartoon can really sum up Dr. Seuss's thoughts about America first or America not getting involved with what's going on over Europe. All of these places have fallen or are falling and that we could be next, but we are not paying attention because we don't think it will happen. So I would argue that those two, of course, there are, very, there are so many, though, right? He talks about um, desegregating the U.S. 
military by the end of World War II. He talks about desegregating um, and integrating. So there are, and I could try to find one of those, but I know we're running out of time. Um, there are many cartoons at the end about that um, and that Dr. Seuss didn't think it made sense to have a segregated military, right? One unit full of white Americans and one unit full of African Americans. And I can't find any of those, but they are in this book. And if you go to that UC San Diego website, they're all there as well. But I know we're just about out of time. You guys did an excellent job. Thank you for allowing me to share Dr. Seuss's work with you. And although not perfect, and you could still critique and analyze many of his things in a negative way, he did work to write that waiting for the signal from home cartoon at the end. And so I hope you'll do more research into this. I hope you'll join us again next semester in spring of 2021 for a second series of our webinars. This is our last one for 2020, but we'll be back in 2021 in January. And thank you. I hope you all have a very happy holidays and we wish you the very best. Bye.